Chapter 2, Family, Social, Cultural, and Religious Influences on Child Health Promotion. So family is whatever a person considers it to be. And realize with kids in the hospital, they're used to their family, whether it's traditional or not. They kind of assume all families are like theirs and they don't realize that theirs may not be the average because it feels right, it feels normal to them. So families can be made up of blood relationships, there may be marital relationships, there may not be either of those things. Your family of origin is the family that you're born into, which is not always the same family that you're raised by. Um, when you're talking with children at the hospital, if you wanna know who's in the household, ask that way, ask who lives at home with them. Because if you say who's in your family, that can be confusing to them. So we do have different types of families and you're gonna see all of these at the hospital, or many of them. The traditional nuclear families, uh, biological parents raising their biological children. The blended family, where they each, each parent has children and they now have come together and formed a family. So we have step uh, relationships in this family. An extended family, more than one generation living together. So children, parents, and grandparents, maybe aunts, uncles, are all living in the same house. Single parent family, one parent trying to raise um, their children uh, by themselves. By nuclear, we have two parents who are not in the same household, but they're both working to raise the children together. Uh, polygamous, I have not seen this at Valley Children's, but um, and it's not legal in the United States, but it certainly does happen where you have, uh, usually it's more than one wife to a husband, but it could be the other way. And communal, there are a few um, kind of commune areas where people live in, in very close uh, proximity with each other, they work together, in a commune, you may have one person who's designated as the primary caregiver for children, and it may not be that child's uh, biologic parent. So you may have somebody who's not related, who's very close and very important to that child's life. And gay and lesbian uh, families, two men raising children or two women raising children. And here's a picture of a family now the family uh, is really where we socialize children. They learn what's acceptable to do and not do in public. They learn you know, their values, um, how to act. They learn language. They learn it's where they they learn um, how to behave it, in society. So the family interacts together to teach children how to do that. That's where they learn how to cope and to uh, deal with stresses. Um, they learn to how to be individu an individual, but also to care for those around them and be part of, of a group. Um, so some of the family roles, in some families, Specific roles are very strong, and in others, people will trade off roles as needed. Um, but in at the family, that's where we learn, you know, what is acceptable. It's not acceptable to hit people in public. You have to learn to control your yourself. So in the family, we get very strong family ties, and family members want to help each other. Children, particularly, they want to conform. They want to do what they know will bring praise from their parents. And the family members are committed to each other, and that's a good, strong family. Uh, in the family, there's also where children learn how to deal with conflict. There will be conflicts that arise, and sometimes that's because expectations weren't met or somebody wasn't even aware of what the expectations were, and so they didn't function the way they were expected to. So parents um, 
we usually expect them to have the parental role and to take care of their children and to teach their children those things that are um, socially acceptable in our culture. Now size and configuration of the family makes a difference. Larger families, there tends to be more unity among the family, kind of more of a uh, we're in this together feeling. But in families with one child can spend a lot more individual time with the child. So there's pros and cons to both, but it does tend to affect um, children and, and what they're used to, what their experience is. And the sibling relationship is probably the, the strongest and longest uh, through the life. Culture, culture is how you do things, what you believe. It, it changes how you view things and it affects the decisions you make. So a culture is a group of people who have those same beliefs, assumptions, practices. Culture is different from race. Race is based on how you look. It's also different from ethnicity. Ethnicity is similar to race, but we've tried to make it where it's less based on how you look, but it's um, still a piece of culture. Culture is broader. And how you parent is very different from one culture to another. What's accepted um, behavior for children in one culture is different than another, and accepted parenting styles is very different. Here's just a picture of some different uh, kids of different ethnicities. and. There are subcultural influences on healthcare. So even though you're American and uh, follow, you know, were raised in American culture, your ethnicity can affect your healthcare. The language you use and how well you understand the language that's used in the hospital, socioeconomic status, your occupation, migrant families, all the, these things. Um, can affect and tend to have a negative impact on health. Religion and religious practices, uh, schools, communities, peer groups, what you're hearing and seeing from social media or the media in general can all affect your health care practices. We know kids who come from poverty, homelessness, migrant families, they all have more health care needs um, and m needs that are not met than kids who aren't from those situations. Transient and unstable living situations also have more health care issues. Having access to health care, there are some places where it's not easy to get if you need specialized care and you're in a place where it just doesn't exist. Or utilization of, of health care. It may not be acceptable to um, some families to use the health care system. They don't trust it or there's some reason uh, that it may be there but they're afraid to use it. If you're here illegally you may be very hesitant to take your child in for a doctor's visit because you don't know what might happen. Religion has an influence on health care. Uh, both there are hereditary and socioeconomic factors that go along with um, religion, but customs and folkways, some of the things that people do make them more prone or less prone to certain illnesses. Beliefs about what will heal an illness. If you believe you need medicine, you go to the doctor. If you believe you need um, a priest to pray for you, you're going to go to a priest. Foods, the foods you eat can affect how you respond to an illness, how quickly you get over something, or uh, how you're more prone, more susceptible to it. How we take care of newborns and critically ill or dying people is very different between different religious religions. And here's a uh, um, newborn practice. Again, very different between different religions. So um, religious beliefs are 
the religion you, you practice or the, your understanding of spirituality. It also affects your beliefs about wellness, um, protection or healing, those daily practices. There are some things that some religions do that we're not very used to in the hospital, but yet they want to do that every morning, and we need to find ways to help them um, be able to do that. The celebrations that you have, the days that are significant, uh, are going to be different between different groups. So healthcare beliefs that can really affect, or religious beliefs that can really affect healthcare. Some religions believe that things happen illness happens from natural forces. You got a bacteria in you. Some would say it's a supernatural force that you lost one of your spirits and that's why you're, you got sick. Some say it's an imbalance that you had too many hot activities or foods and now you are sick because you need cold to balance it out. You can see how that's gonna change who you go to for help. Um, and preventative treatments as well. There are many different, uh, you know, acupuncture, coining, cupping, cupping, many different things that people do to treat illnesses or prevent illnesses. And um, our job as nurses is not to tell people that they're right or wrong, but to get them the health care that they are comfortable with based on and then based based on scientific outcomes what do we know will help them um, but if we can incorporate what makes them comfortable plus what has scientific research behind it that's what we're going to try and do and all of that means being culturally competent to not tell them how we want them to do it but to ask them how they do it and how they can incorporate our recommendations into their practices. Um, that, that is really what cultural competence is. But to be culturally competent, you have to know your own values because we all are used to our own ways. And we kind of go on the assumption that everybody else thinks and feels the same as we do unless we stop and really evaluate our own beliefs our own values so that we don't just impose those on others so that we ask other people what they believe before we assume that that it's the same as us